Welcome to Successful Philanthropy. I'm your host, Jean Shafaroff, and this show is designed to highlight the work of leaders in the United States and then beyond. Today with us, New York State Assemblywoman Rebecca Seawright. Let's all welcome Rebecca. And Rebecca, so many people don't realize what goes into being an elected official. Now, you've been in government, I believe, as an elected official for the last seven years. What is your background and why did you get involved in politics? Well, thank you, Jean. It's such an honor to be back on your show and always such a pleasure. Um, so I was first inspired uh, to enter politics. Uh, back in 2014, I was serving on community board aid and had been a former prosecutor and administrative law judge. And I received a phone call out of the blue from Eleanor's Legacy. Uh, which recruits and trains women to run for office, and also from the National Organization for Women, Sonia Osorio, a longtime activist. And they said, Rebecca, we would love for you to consider running for this open seat. My predecessor had been brought up on charges and sanctioned by the speaker for sexual harassment charges. And so, um, you know, I asked them, uh, how many men were in the race? There was no woman. Uh, they were looking for a woman to run. And they said three. And I said, only three. So um, I entered the race and I was very fortunate to, to uh, be elected. And um, we've done some really good legislation since I first took office that we're very proud of and, and are continuing to work to pass uh, progressive good legislation in response to COVID. And can you give me an example of some of the legislation you're trying to pass right now as it pertains specifically to women first? So I am the lead sponsor in the Assembly of the Equal Rights Amendment. And I think it's so important that we update our state constitution to include classes like women in our state constitution. United States Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg once said, we'll never have complete equality until we put the Equal Rights Amendment in our both state and federal constitution. Every constitution in the land has the Equal Rights Amendment the federal constitution does not. So by updating our state constitution and putting this in, I feel like it will be momentum for them to finally, finally get it done at the federal level as well. So it has to pass two successive sessions and then be put before the voters as a referendum in order to be in our state constitution. And when do you think this might happen? We go into session in January unless we're called into a special session. It doesn't look like that's on the horizon, but with the COVID Delta variant, who knows? But if we go into session that first week in January, which is set by statute and the constitution, um, then we have the bill already introduced. We're in the second year of a two year session cycle. So we will pick that bill right up in committee and um, refer it out to the floor for debate and passage in the assembly. Uh, then we will need to pass it in the Senate. It'll be transmitted to uh, the governor for review. But as a constitutional amendment, it doesn't require uh, the governor's signature. Interesting. And, and now I think most women actually can't believe that the Equal Rights Amendment is not part of the U.S. Constitution. And so for many, many women across the United States, the fact that you're involved in getting this passed on a state level, which will then enable or, or <laughs> hopefully push forth this passage of the Equal Rights Amendment on a federal level, this is all great. And I think women look up to you for your leadership, also men, because men also want this bill passed. Now, Rebecca, I wanna hear more about the legislation that you're involved in getting passed, but I wanna first talk about the COVID-19 pandemic and now this new Delta strain. What's going to happen starting September, October, November in New York City? Do you see the city shutting down again or do you think we'll be going into big galas and big events or big 
of theaters with uh, masks on and, and uh, will we need to have to show a vaccination card? What do you envision exactly? Well, it's, that's a great question, Jean. Thank you. And just today, Governor Cuomo issued a mandate that now all healthcare workers have to be vaccinated and show proof in our healthcare institutions like our hospitals, nursing homes, and rehab centers. So the time uh, it's, it, it's not a time right now to be dropping our guard against the COVID variant. We're seeing in Florida an explosive amount of the Delta variant where their hospitals are overwhelmed. And so I think we have to be very, very cautious, especially in Manhattan with our public transportation where we see high volumes of people. So, um, you know, the CDC guidelines are very important and they're encouraging people to get the vaccine. And, but we know that this Delta variant is very, very strong and that people that have been vaccinated are still getting it. So it's hard to predict exactly what's gonna happen, but what I am being told is we are gonna see a surge. Our college campuses are starting to open back. Our school kids will be coming back. People will be coming in from vacations and second homes and other places. Places. And so we're expecting to see a surge and we have to be ready for it in New York state. And we're, we have a new governor that's going to be sworn in on the 24th, a new mayor that will be sworn in in January. And I think it's so important that we all work and follow the federal guidelines uh, that keep changing and we need to stay on top of those. I know one of the things that my office continues to do every Thursday on a weekly basis is distribute thousands of face masks to the public. If it's a hot sunny day, then we're out on the sidewalk. If it's raining, we have the table right inside our storefront government district office right next to the post office where people can come in, get a mask, get some free sanitizer and restock up. And we've just put a note back on the front door that says you have to have a mask on to enter our government office. And if you don't, we'll provide a mask for you. So I think it's, it's, it's very important that we are cognizant of this increase and what's being predicted as a surge going forward. And do you think we are going to have a lot of closures in New York City come the fall? I hope not. I have, very, I have a lot of restaurants and small businesses here on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, and they've told me that they barely survived the last shutdown, and they can't survive another shutdown of their business. And so we're working very hard on small business incentives and grants, but we've lost a lot of businesses here on the Upper East Side and all over Manhattan. It's just not the same city that it used to be. Storefronts have closed. People are really struggling. And so I think that's why it's so important, Jean, uh, what you're known for is your wonderful philanthropy and that great book that you've written, that anybody can be a philanthropist. They can donate their time, their money. And that's what we're going to need during COVID is supporting our organizations that are helping people out there during COVID-19 and the Delta variant. Yes. And hopefully we'll get through this new surge and we will move forward. Now, Rebecca, we have a new governor coming into office, Kathy Hochul, she's a woman. It's going to be the first time in the state of New York that a woman becomes governor. And I'm excited about that. What are your thoughts? I think she's gonna be an absolutely outstanding governor. I've known Kathy Hochul uh, for years now. I've campaigned with her on the street. She's come to the Upper East Side and stood with me outside what I call the Super Bowl of Subways, the Lexington Avenue line on 86th Street. And just this past year, she met me on 2nd Avenue uh, between 83rd and 84th at the subway stop there. She has a lot of energy. She's very smart. She has served at every single level of government. When she was first elected at the local level, then she served in Congress and she has gotten to know the state really, really well, running around uh, pushing her agenda and Governor Cuomo uh, legislation and policy and helping us get through COVID-19. So I think she is going to expand on that as governor of the state of New York. She is highly qualified. And I think that we will see, she will focus on reforms in Albany, 
So what brought down this last governor is not repeated and does not happen again. And so it's my hope that she's going to focus, number one, on transparency, number two, on reforming our system, and number three, on COVID, because I think those are our top three priorities right now, not in any necessary order. I think we have to have COVID first, and we have to protect people and keep people safe. But we also need to examine what we need to do in terms of reform, reform of our election process. And I have a couple of election reform bills that I've passed and others that are still in the hopper, but also reforms that we need ethically. And with sexual harassment, we have to take that seriously. I was pleased to be appointed by Speaker Hasty just this past session to the sexual harassment work group made up of legislators in Albany. And we're gonna be examining uh, legislation for January for this coming session and what we need to do to tighten the laws. One of the things that I did was a press conference with the Cosby sister and the Weinstein survivors to talk about updating the penal code and finally defining consent. And what does consent mean? We have different judges saying different things. And so let's define consent and let's put it on the books. So once and for all, Judges will have the same definition of what consent is and what it means. And so I'm really excited about this legislation. It came to me from a constituent. Some of the best legislation comes from constituents that come and walk right in the door and tell me about problems they're having or ideas that they have. And another example is a woman came into the office and needed a 3D mammogram. Her doctor had prescribed it. Her insurance wouldn't cover it. And I sat down with her and said, that is just not fair. And so let's go to Albany, let's pass a law and let's change it so that you can get a 3D mammogram. So I was invited back in 2017 to speak before uh, the National Health Association so that state legislatures around the country could replicate the bill that we passed in New York. And for our audience, we are with New York State Assemblywoman Rebecca Seawright. She's filling us in on the COVID-19 pandemic and what the future looks like for New York. She's discussed our new governor, Kathy Hochul, coming into office. She's discussed new laws coming into, um, probably that will be passed in Albany concerning uh, sexual abuse, concerning women's rights, She's discussed a whole host of different topics. Now, Rebecca, we have a new race for the mayor of New York. And one of the top priorities for the city of New York is to fight crime. Talk a little bit about that because people are very afraid. People have left New York. They're fearful of the crime. They're afraid of COVID. They're afraid of a lot of things. What do you envision moving forward? So as you know, our Democratic nomination nominee for mayor of New York City is Eric Adams. And he is a former police officer and he wore a bulletproof vest for years. And I think that I have endorsed him and I think that he is the perfect person to lead this city right now in this time because of his law enforcement background. I think that he will do a wonderful job in making our city safer so that people can bounce back after COVID-19. And so I have full faith and credit that as a former police officer, he is going to make history and go down in the books as one of the best mayors that we have ever seen in New York City, because he is going to help bring us out of COVID-19, make our streets safer, make our subways safer. We've seen an uptick in crime right here on the Upper East Side in my district, and I've hosted a crime prevention forum with the 19th precinct. I've also had a couple of town halls, uh, Town Hall Tuesdays, which I launched, and we held our 50th town hall to talk about what we can do uh, with crime right here in this neighborhood. We had a, a week ago a 19th police precinct night out in John Jay Park where the community was able to come into the park and meet our 
fabulous woman, uh, 19th Precinct Chief Inspector Melissa Iger, and the Community Affairs Division, the detectives of the 19th Precinct, so that they feel safe and that they're having access. And when they do see something, that they call the 19th Precinct or they call 911 and they report it. So I think that our upcoming mayor, if he wins in November, and I think he will, uh, is going to uh, be an excellent, excellent mayor to um, lower our crime in the city coming out of COVID. And yes, and we all want the crime to go down. And if we have a mayor who has a background in preventing and fighting crime, I think it's a good thing because people all over New York City in every single borough is worried about crime and number one priority is reduction of crime in New York City so that our tourists come back, so that our people come back, so that people don't want to leave the city. And of course, another great priority is fighting and tackling the COVID-19 pandemic and any future variants that might arise and protecting the people of the city. Now, Rebecca, this show is about philanthropy. And I know through your work, you do so much for the people of New York. And you also make an appearance at many different charity events for the LGBTQ community and for many, many other groups. Talk a little bit about philanthropy and what it means to you and what it should mean to your constituents. So I think philanthropy is so important. And Jean, you've been such a role model with coming out with your book on philanthropy and how anyone can basically be a philanthropist, whether it's volunteering their time or giving their money and their resources or donating some of their used clothing for an auction, if it's designer, or um, there's just so many different ways that people can participate. And, you know, last uh, March, a year ago, we were delivering meals here on the Upper East Side with Mills on Wheels and the Stanley Isaac Center. And so it's so important if a person doesn't wanna give money or doesn't have the resources, they can volunteer their time and deliver meals to the shut-in. We were leaving them right outside the door and ringing the bell so we weren't coming into contact with many of the people that are shut in that were senior citizens. And so we welcome people to call our office at 212-288-4607 and we will connect you with an organization where you can volunteer your time to deliver meals uh, to the shut-in or to pick up their uh, paper that they might want shredded at our next shred-a-thon to protect our environment. So there's so many different ways that people can give back and contribute. And I like that. And I believe that those who have resources have a responsibility and an obligation to give of their resources to those who may have a lot less. And you do that uh, through charitable organizations and finding something that you really love to do. Find, find a cause and look for a charity, get on the internet, do a little research, and then learn all you can about a charity, then get involved with the group that you think is, think is being run properly and where you think you can make a difference. Now, Rebecca, getting back to you, your top priorities, you started telling us some of them. I'd like to hear more of your priorities for 20, the end of 2021 and then into 2022 and then 2023. So our top priority and my top priority has to be uh, COVID and staying on top of it and keeping people safe. And so as we go into legislative session with a new governor in January, we'll be negotiating our state budget. I was appointed to the Ways and Means Committee, which does the budget by Speaker Hasty last year. I look forward to continuing to serve on Ways and Means, where we have every state agency, including our higher education institutions, our CUNY and SUNY chancellors come before us and testify on what their budget needs are, as well as uh, people are welcome to submit their requests for what they are, would like to see uh, strengthened 
And so as we do these hearings, which last over a month in Albany, sometimes in the cold snow, these hearings go till midnight. Last year we did them by Zoom because of COVID. We will start to talk about our priorities in the assembly, the priorities in the Senate, and the governor's priorities. And then we appoint the mothership and come together as we negotiate this multi, multi-billion dollar budget. And coming out of COVID, I think it's so important that we prioritize for people that have lost their jobs, uh, people that are having trouble paying their rent, uh, people that have food insecurity that are hungry, or they, they have a pet that they can no longer keep because they've lost their job. And so it's so important that we hear the priorities of the public and that we listen to that. And as we're in Albany, we carve out a budget that works for this state and for all of the people that are so desperately in need. My office has a dedicated staffer to handle just unemployment claims because with COVID so many people lost their jobs and they were having trouble getting their unemployment checks. They were able to call Courtney Ferrissey in my office and get help. So if you're having trouble, with something as simple as renewing your driver's license, uh, you can call our office. We're happy to step into the uh, whatever the issue is with the government agency, whether it's city, state, or federal, and try to help you get results because people are desperate for some kind of uh, relief during COVID. Every day the CDC guidelines are changing, and so we try to put out every single week what are those new guidelines? What do people need to do to stay safe? And so our top priority as we begin in January to negotiate the budget is going to have to be the COVID variant and where we are and where our resources in the state budget need to be put. And I think a lot of people may not realize that as we slowly, hopefully move out of this pandemic, the problems that were caused by the pandemic remain for many because thousands and thousands of people and millions of people lost their jobs across the United States. Many have never gotten those jobs back. Rebecca, do the food pantry lines continue to be very long in New York City and then around the country? And for people watching, what do you suggest? I know I've always recommended a few charities to donate to, to help with food insecurity, like Feeding America, uh, the um, City Meals on Wheels, and a number of others, but God's Love We Deliver, et cetera, et cetera. But what do you suggest, Rebecca? You know, that's a great question. Question And of course, I um, am partial to the uh, charities in my district. And so there's search and care that specifically focuses on senior citizens and helping those remain in their homes that are shut in and, and to be safe um, and not be transferred to a nursing home. Um, you know, Jean, I just went the other day over to All Souls Church. Um, on Third Avenue, and I saw um, the long lines for people waiting in line to get their free food package. And so um, there's so many charities out there that I would suggest people donate to wherever they have a passion and a specific interest, whether it's in, you know, the American Humane Society and animal rights and animals um, that are starving during COVID-19, or whether it's helping food pantries, like the one at the Stanley Isaacs House and City Mills on Wills, um, the Doe Fund that keeps our streets clean. Um, and it has a re-entry uh, program with the prisons. So there's just so many things out there that I would really evaluate as a philanthropist, as a person that's looking to donate money and time, what is your passion? And what is the issue that you're most concerned about that has affected your life? Maybe you have a, a relative that is afraid about being institutionalized in a nursing home that's elderly. So then you wanna to steer toward organizations that help our senior citizens. And our office certainly has a list um, of different places where people can volunteer and also contribute. And as we look forward, Rebecca, are you positive about New York City? I'm positive. I think we're going to have a lot of good change. We'll have 
a new administration with a new focus on preventing crime, which I like very much. And I do think that this pandemic is slowly, slowly leaving us. We may have other variants, but I do believe that we are seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. And what are your thoughts? I think that New York is strong and New York is tough. And just as we saw after 9-11, we bounced back. And I think that we will defeat this virus and we will bounce back. You can go down 2nd Avenue in the 80s and see the long lines outside the yogurt stops uh, stores at night when the weather is nice outside. And I'm beginning to see empty storefronts open up and become occupied. So I think that New York will bounce back. I think having uh, a new governor sworn in, she's going to do a great job. And she's very familiar with New York City. And also also a new mayor starting in, in January. I think it's an exciting time. We're going to see a lot of new city council members um, and borough presidents. And so I think the city is has elected some really experienced people and that we will bounce back stronger than ever. And Rebecca, we just have a very few minutes left. What advice would you give to young people who want to get involved in government and who might want to follow your path? So that, that's a great question. And I have an office full of young interns, high school and college age interns. And so just as I started my political career interning for United States Senator Lloyd Benson in Washington, D.C., and I would suggest that if you're interested in politics, you're interested in government service, volunteer in a government office, or if you're interested in the political side, volunteer on a political campaign. But you can make a difference. And so I would recommend that you call your elected officials office and uh, volunteer to uh, either work in their office or work virtually doing research, something that you're passionate about, and uh, you will make a difference. And finally, what advice do you give to people now who maybe lost jobs and are having a tough time struggling with their future? It's never too late to reinvent yourself. And I've heard from a lot of my constituents that we've met with to help uh, refer to the small business services to design a business plan because they're reinventing their self. And so it's never too late to change your course of path. And, you know, now I think a lot of people need help just navigating all the social media platforms and Zoom. There's a lot of senior citizens out there that uh, need help that'll stop in the the office and we're always glad to see them because a glitch has come up on their cell phone. And so I would say help others. That's a great philosophy. Just help others and it'll make you feel good and you'll be doing something that so affects another person's life, whether it's just helping a senior citizen with their cell phone or their Zoom credentials. Um, volunteer pick up garbage in our parks, and become a philanthropist, whether it's donating your time, your money, your energy. Uh, and coming out of COVID, that's what we all need right now. Thank you very much, Rebecca Seawright. This concludes Successful Philanthropy. Today's guest, New York State Assemblywoman Rebecca Seawright. I'm your host, Jean Shaparoff. I'll see you next week.